We are very happy to uh, present Professor Dr. Gertrud Koch here at our conference. And uh, before I say something about the, the theme that uh, Frau Koch will talk about, let me briefly introduce her. Um, Gertrud Koch is a professor of film studies at the Free University in Berlin. Uh, she did numerous research at the Humanities, Humanities Institute in Essen also the Getty Research Center in Los Angeles, just only to name a few. Um, she dedicated herself in numerous publications and monographs like Her on Herbert Marcuse, An Introduction, uh, which was published together with Hauke Brunkhorst, uh, published in 1987. Um, another noteworthy publication, What I Loot, are pictures a cinematic representation of gender difference, which was published in Frankfurt am Main, 1988. Also, a very important publication is The Attitude is the Attitude Towards a Visual Construction of Judaism, published in Frankfurt am Main in 1992. Also, a very special research field of Gertrud Koch is um, uh, Siegfried K Krakauer, and uh, the very noteworthy publication, Siegfried Krakauer, an introduction, published in Hamburg, 1996. She's editor of numerous anthologies, um, also, uh, among others, on synesthesia. I just want to uh, note the, um, the, the research projects, um, uh, Synesthesie Effekte, and uh, also organized uh, various conference, among others, also actually with an emphasis on synesthesia. Uh, also, she's co-editor of numerous German and international magazines. Today, and with it now, we jump actually into the contemporary world and into um, the, the field of film. And today, uh, Gertrud Koch will uh, present us a talk about word and object in film, a synesthetic presentation. And I'm so happy to welcome you. Um, Frau Koch, please. Yes, so I'm actually uh, uh, not reading uh, my paper. Um, so I want actually to go from a different maybe um, point of departure for the debate. Um, and this, I think it came through quite clear that uh, if we speak about synesthesia, uh, not so much as a natural phenomenon um, as neuroscientists would be interested in, uh, but more on uh, as an aesthetic problem, um, then it seems that we have already two different poetics of synesthesia involved here. So one we, uh, uh, we have, uh, I think, we can observe in different, uh, uh, here in the exhibition also, but also in this kind of uh, olfactory uh, 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 phenomenon uh, that we uh, just uh, were informed about. And uh, uh, I think what will be the distinction between these two modes to take synesthesia as a poetic procedure, so to say, is that in the first one, um, synesthesia is seen as a possibility to translate from one sense into each other. And it's interesting that mostly um, this is done with a um, kind of basic intention to create kind of identical recourses. So I found it very interesting. Sorry. No, it was not mine. It's the same sound. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, guilt feelings all over the world. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. It's better now? A little bit on. I think, uh, um, so now it's better. Um, so I don't want to bite in it. But uh, uh, anything, so anyway, so I think this uh, came quite clear that on some level, um, the basic idea is that you can translate one sensual sensation into another. 
and this process of translation uh, becomes a kind of automatic processing. Uh, so when you look, uh, for example, at the examples we have seen here in the exhibition, you can see it's a, a, you know, a kind of structural um, idea, um, the real synesthetes uh, would indeed have the same color perception uh, for the same letter in the alphabet and so on. And so you would get a kind of color order that is also, I mean, uh, marked by the statistical um, distribution of letters in writing that is not equal for languages and so on. So on some level you have this kind of, let's say, a mechanical translation, uh, which on some level goes back to the idea that the senses are apparatuses in themselves, that they can translate uh, uh, one into each other. And uh, when you um, look at this, um, the main idea is that uh, there is something to be triggered. And I thought it interesting that even um, uh, 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 in the last uh, uh, lecture, um, this was uh, very much emphasized with, uh, with this idea that uh, um, smell and odor are identity marks. So it's a self-identical uh, sign system uh, that looks for a kind of one-to-one -one translation. So on some level one can say if this is translated into an aesthetic framework, um, one can argue, so what is the thrill to do it? Um, weren't we at one point over the idea of mechanical triggered identity? <laughs> so what is the thrill? What is the, uh, 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 the secret we are looking um, for when we are, I mean, confronting um, this kind of phenomenon. And on some level, I mean, as a, as a viewer, um, you don't know even if the artist was, I mean, in this group of synthesis, syn synesthetics, is this a term, I don't know, um, or not. It can be a kind of uh, uh, arbitrary system that was just an aesthetic invention. So anyway, so I think the main idea is that you have this kind of uh, um, play with an automatism that goes back to this, I mean, let's say, surrealist uh, uh, techniques of automatic writing. So you have an automatic coloring. The identity part is strong in this one very ironic uh, work we have, um, uh, we have uh, a scene here in the gallery. Um, it's even, I mean, uh, uh, termed in corrections, a series of corrections. So there were wrong signs and you have to correct it to fit them in your, in your proper uh, uh, a scheme of color and letters relationships. So on some level one can say um, this model um, may stem much more um, from a romantic uh, 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 idea of the machine as being autonomous a machine that has its own program and that can be this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, enchanting translator uh, from one sense to the other, uh, where indeed, uh, let's say, the romantic appeal is that it gives up this hierarchization. So it's equal translation. I mean, it's a very idealized uh, model I'm uh, uh, um, uh, tracing here. But uh, uh, I think on some level it's interesting to look at this um, in terms of what kind of poetic drives are uh, we confronting here. The other mod model, and this is uh, one I would uh, emphasize here, um, relating uh, related to film, um, is a different one. Why I would do go for a different system for film? I think it's quite obvious that film uh, never can be the translation from one sensual system into another because film in itself is already multimodally organized. So you wouldn't have any, I mean, possible translation from a multimodal system into what? I mean, it doesn't work. So either you take this uh, uh, a trigger model where one sense, I mean, you know, translates into an another or transforms, whatever you just, how do you would describe it as a poetic procedure. Um, but for film, you would have already a kind of syn 
aesthetic model where the sin aesthetic is not so much understood as a concrete transfer from one to the other, but as a kind of a um, combination of senses, a kind of collage, of montage, however you would call this kind of procedures, aesthetic procedures, but definitely is it's not a translation model. Um, the only translation model I know um, was uh, in the uh, relationship um, to film and music, um, the so-called Mickey Mousing, which was a system where you try to get in each movement uh, what is inherent in the picture, um, you would find uh, an illustrative sound uh, to go with this specific frame or movement in the frame. So Eisenstein worked on this uh, uh, model. Uh, there are interesting uh, uh, graphic schemes of this and uh, uh, he took it already from um, his beloved uh, uh, Disney um, where he uh, uh, experienced that you can uh, uh, indeed go into this kind of uh, uh, rhythmic um, ecstasy that it's all different senses are brought together uh, into this kind of uh, uh, explosive model, what Eisenstein called, uh, related to the Disney films, the early animation films, um, ecstasy of pure form. So it's uh, um, an interesting model, um, but still it has not so much to do with this first model of uh, uh, synesthesia. And uh, here I come now to some uh, uh, more um, theoretical uh, remarks before I then jump to the uh, my example, uh, so to say. Um, so the this idea, the second idea, the second model, um, where it's more uh, that is much more built on the idea of a plasticity of senses um, that are in a multimodal um, exchange um, and that are on some level located in the body as is um, um, the spirit, so to say. So on some level, you have here a holistic model uh, where you no longer can, I mean, come into this uh, uh, divisions. And on some level, this was uh, 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 founded, um, I, I'm sure we have many, many more sources as we heard in this really um, enlightening lecture this morning. Um, but I would focus it here for uh, many reasons um, on having, let's say, started uh, with uh, Herder's uh, 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 philosophy of uh, uh, language, so to say, uh, where Herder already has this uh, uh, a question, um, how, I mean, when he asked, for example, how does uh, um, face, view, and hearing, color, and word uh, smell and sound together. Um, uh, and not so, mu not so, mu uh, so much among themselves in the objects, uh, but what are these qualities in the objects? Um, they are sensual uh, sensations in us, and this is for him the important thing, and as such, um, they don't, uh, 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 doesn't they flew all into one? Uh, and then comes this uh, conclusion that I would uh, take as a role model for my model. Um, we are, he says, one thinking sensorium commune. Um, so we are just touched from different sides, he says, and this is where the explanation lies, that we are one thinking sensorium commune. And uh, um, with this said, um, I guess uh, here is already um, done this enormous jump from thinking um, uh, cognition, language, uh, and speech as opposed uh, to the senses. So here is already a kind of holistic model where body and spirit are not seen as distinctive elements, but on some level the body is the site of all sensations and our thoughts, and our thoughts and feeling 
so to say, is no longer um, uh, a kind of abstract opposition. And this one can say is this uh, a, a romantic model um, of uh, a German idealism uh, that was so, I mean, influential um, for aesthetics as, you know, one of the famous um, program um, of this uh, romantic school, the so-called all the system program of German idealism, 1797, it's not quite clear to, um, to date it, um, formulated this in a very short and influential way. Uh, this paper of, uh, uh, it's this pro program is not one and a half pages. Um, it was found only in uh, uh, the beginning of the 19th century, 1913, by Franz Rosenzweig, so it, uh, it's no accident um, that this program became the influential cornerstone um, for uh, the aesthetic of the 20th century, um, as it's not, uh, 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 you know, um, the whole philosophical tradition, but a very romantic, fragmentary um, object, a lost object, where even authorship is unclear, so it was ascribed to Hegel um, and Hölderlin and Schelling, and there's a whole philosophical debate still going on who might have been the author. I spare you this, I did it on, in another place, but I just wanted to quote you from this program um, to uh, 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 why I come back to a minute in this. Finally, the, which the idea which unites it all, the idea of beauty, the word taken in the higher taken in the higher platonic sense. I'm convinced that the highest act of reason, which in that it comprises all ideas, is an aesthetic act. And that truth and goodness are united like sisters only in beauty. The philosopher must possess just as much aesthetic power as the poet. The people without aesthetic sense are our philosophers of the latter. The philosophy of the spirit is an aesthetic philosophy. One cannot be clever in anything. One cannot even reason clearly in history without aesthetic sense. It should now be revealed here what those people who do not understand ideas are actually lacking and candidly enough admit that everything is obscure to them as soon as one goes beyond charts and indices. So this program basically is uh, at stake when, I mean, all this educational Montessori <laughs> whatsoever um, came into play that on some level you have to, um, to take the senses and the cognition um, in one step, so to say. Um, you cannot divide it um, anymore. So why for me it's important to say that this program became this kind of a, um, fundamental text, um, for example, for a thinker like Jacques Rancière, um, who quotes, I mean, extensively the oldest system program. Um, I think it has to do um, that it was already referring um, to an opposition between the mechanical state, this is a political aesthetic moment in this program, it's against the mechanical state and the transformation of the mechanical state would be through this kind of aesthetization. So the aesthetization um, of the world would be uh, the political answer uh, to the uh, uh, Prussian state. Um, the concept in itself um, includes, and this is for me the interesting part here, um, indeed a broader theory of language um, that is based also in sense perceptual um, origins and it's not something that comes, let's say, from a platonic um, heaven of grammar. So language itself is seen already as a kind of, you know, in graphemes and phonemes, so a kind of centrally um, uh, operating um, a system. So this for me um, could be the only program, if you want, um, of synesthesia um, that would on some level fit um, the film aesthetic um, potential um, as film developed in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and again, you have even here this opposition about the, uh, the opposition of something that is thought mechanical and the 
making, moving, um, and going into a move um, that film offers. So on some level, film seems to fulfill this program to overcome the mechanical apparatus in producing something ephemeral and moving and something that develops in time. And therefore, you can see that film not only as a technical invention, but also as an aesthetic program. Indeed, I think Zeron here was right. I mean, fulfills on some level this romantic um, idea that you can animate, you can bring something into a kind of lifelike um, a, a movement. And uh, um, so my question here is that nearby it's the same moment, um, film um, was always um, a medium uh, that had to struggle with um, incorporating uh, language in pictures. Uh, you don't have in uh, visual media before, but in film you have it, and it comes because film has this holistic possibilities to integrate and synthesize sound in a way into pictures that was unheard before. I mean, you had it in opera, um, where you had a kind of a visual uh, theatrical staging and music um, uh, uh, sought together. Uh, but in film, on some level, you have it on uh, uh, on uh, much more levels. So the only thing that really also is uh, lacking here is uh, smell. And, uh, uh, you know, there were always also attempts in film to, I mean, to integrate smell. Thanks God they gave it up. It's a, 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 it's a terrible idea. But it's a, nevertheless, um, it has to do with this idea that film was encompassing all this, I mean, sensomotoric um, uh, aspects. And uh, when a smell would come t together with all this, um, then you would have this, uh, uh, I mean, whole closure of an illusion illusionistic um, uh, world. And uh, uh, on some level, we know that everything that is going on in the the harm of the spectator is mostly to destroy illusion. So therefore, my uh, hint that it might be not a good idea to have smell in cinema, but it's uh, 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 maybe they will develop it. Um, anyway, so m my concept here is to look at film uh, specific and as under this uh, uh, aspect, how language is here integrated and how does language itself um, in film uh, becomes this uh, uh, synesthetic component and not just, I mean, the medium of information and grammar and so on. Um, so I wanted to start with a kind of uh, um, uh, yeah, a kind of language theory <laughs> that is from 1891. You see it here. Um, the author is uh, 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 Sigmund Freud. Um, it's from his early work uh, where he was not yet, I mean, um, developing psychoanalysis, as you can imagine, in 91. So it's from his early writings on aphasia. And the interesting model he devo developed is indeed um, um, uh, linked to this um, a problem that he later on in his writing on the subconscious um, introduced it very uh, interestingly, uh, the distinction between what he called Wortvorstellung and Sachvorstellung, word representation and thing or object representation. So what you see here is already in, uh, 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 um, a foreplay uh, to his later um, theory how um, language and words are interweaving um, this different, um, let's say, um, uh, aspects and dimensions of consciousness and unconsciousness. The word he writes is a complex, cons a complex uh, uh, presentation, representation, imagination that is uh, consisting, um, uh, consisting in images or to put it differently, um, there's an equi equivalent uh, to the word from a com very complicated 
a procedure of associations um, done by the elements of visual, acoustic, and kinesthetic uh, origin. And that they, I mean, you know, it's this kind of uh, links they have uh, um, uh, among themselves. Um, the word, um, I had it here translated, I'm sorry. Too bad, I lost my uh, translation. Um, the word uh, um, uh, gains its uh, meaning uh, through the um, uh, stitching together with the uh, uh, representation of objects, uh, at least if we, if we um, concentrate our, uh, our thoughts, our uh, considerations on uh, substantives. Um, the object uh, representation itself um, is again a complex of associations from this um, different visual, acoustic, tactile, kinesthetic, and other representations. And uh, so when you look at the, uh, the scheme, uh, you see um, you have the object associations that are visual, tactile, and acoustic, and this forms into a Klangbild, what is a sound image, uh, from the sound image, you go to the um, reading image, so the graphemes, if you will, uh, like, and from there to the shift build, the writing image. And then you have, uh, uh, from, from the sound image, a bewegungs moving image, the image of a kinesthetic uh, 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 image. So the word representation is already, I mean, fed by this very complex um, texture of sound, of tactility, of, you know, images, of writing, um, of reading, and of kinesthetic, sensomotoric aspects. So all this is language on some level, and you see it's a Language is seen here as a much bigger complex, as language is uh, uh, um, linked to our sensual um, being in the world on some level. So it's not that you can really come to a split here. Um, in this model, I would say, and I leave aside the later, psycho in, in a closer sense, psychoanalytic, reading that uh, Freud then started from his own uh, uh, beginnings. Um, so I took take this model um, as a model of a synesthetic um, framing of language in film. So indeed in film you have speech, you have writing, uh, you have sound, um, you have a kind of a, a, a very complex synesthetically used uh, tactility that goes to the morphological surface of objects um, that are pretty well um, uh, translated even from this um, uh, 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 two-dimensional uh, light projection we finally see as film. So Freud's scheme in many ways reflects the synesthetic qualities of language when it is taken away from the mere grammatical and logical functions it allows to perform. The fluidity between visual, acoustic, tactile, and kinetic streams that are channeling the modality of the production of meaning in words, in words could serve in many ways as a blueprint to map the complex way in which language and image is interwoven in film. The written, spoken, and heard language that shows and hers as voices, typefaces, letters, songs, and sounds work into the scenic representation of the said and heard. The representation, and I come now to my, um, my uh, uh, example here. Um, it's taken from uh, a work I have done on the films of Chris Marquer. Um, in his films, language is extremely important. And uh, uh, so my um, hypothesis here is um, that, let's say, what, ma what makes Marquer's films interesting 
in an aesthetic way as films and what gives him, let's say, um, what I, I was interested in on some level to analyze his poetic of film. So not so much what has he to say as a political essay filmmaker. So I'm not content oriented here. So I'm interested how he's using language in this kind of a broader um, synesthetic frame and how he is playing with this, I mean, synesthesia one triggering effects, but as we know, I mean, language um, used in a more poetic way um, is not able to trigger one reaction. So it's already an interplay between the modality of the virtuality of film where it could be also another image. So, I mean, the idea is that uh, we were very aware that we are presenting here, pre uh, that we are, uh, um, uh, that it's presented to us a very specific um, choice of images or an artifact and not a natural triggered, you know, um, association. So, um, I show you um, from my, if I find it. So it's very short. Kitchen chain change in a man. What is this? I would say what uh, um, Marquer is doing here is he tells us a joke. Uh, he tells a joke um, that has a charm of what one calls in the uh, typology of jokes a one-liner. A one-liner joke is a type of a verbal joke, one that has it all in one line like the joke Carl Valentin, a Bavarian comedian, once made, and which points to my situation, situation here regarding speaking about synesthesia, I guess. The one-liner by Valentin is, everything was said already, but not from everyone. A one-liner joke is said to be the shorter the better. Nevertheless, its wit comes from the multiple meanings it entails. Marquer's wit often unfolds between words and images, like in the following shot from Chaperche, you have seen it already. It starts with a title card, Un pigeon se change en homme. This is the first part of the one-liner, and the second part is the camera's tracking shot through the subway station, starting with a pigeon on the floor, following its flight via a light pan, and turning around the corner where it focuses on a man's back, who is ready to leave the station through the door at the end of the stairs in the background. Shot in real time, the joke has a double structure. First, it answers the rhetorical question underlying the title card, how does a pigeon can change into a man? And the, sho the shot finally answers the question by suggesting that in cinematic poetics, a pen can be a pun. The sidekick often used in slapstick films alludes to the magic power of film and its capacity to turn real things into fictional objects without even touching them, just by modulating the perspective. A capacity that is in this shot nevertheless set in this shot nevertheless depends on a performative act, the one the title card enacts the propositional sentence that claims that what we will see is a pigeon changing into a man changes foremost our expectation and makes thereby clear that we are not expected to see a short glimpse on, on men and other animals moving through a subway station. The joke is working via the decentering of our habits of viewing, in Audin's, Audin's term, shifting semiopragmatics from documentary to fiction. But the joke is also about the special effects as an aesthetic and rhetoric procedure to produce extra value in big films. The joke only functions in so far as we deep down are convinced 
that's a magic marker, has a magi magic pen that combi combines pen, pan, and pun. But the joke not only involves the fragile status of the picture taken that turns into an image of something totally immaterial, it bends back to language itself. The octorial sentence sets our imagination in motion and in science to language the power of poetic creation. In Marquer's film, images seem to shift between different modalities. They may signify both the world in front of the camera as well as a mental image that results from the interplay between what Freud called Wortvorstellung, word representation, and Sachvorstellung, thing representation. And I think I make just a, um, a stop here because that's basically um, my argument um, integrating language into a concept of synesthesia um, for film aesthetics. I mean, if you want to go for synesthetic moments in film, you cannot avoid language. <laughs> so, and so far I would say that uh, uh, um, synesthesia in film aesthetics uh, would mostly always um, have to go back uh, to the Herder model, so to say, and uh, therefore um, is in itself already uh, uh, an answer, and so far also film is an answer um, to the non-poetic use of language um, as a sheer either logical grammar system or a system of pure, I mean, designation in terms of identical, um, I of identifying objects. So, and so far I would say that uh, um, the poetic use of language in film works through the synesthetic moments in language itself. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much, um, Gertrude, for the um, presentation, for the complex uh, presentation, and also the second model of synesthesia, this film as an answer. Um, I would really like to take the time for a discussion, so maybe we just really shift uh, another 10, 15 minutes or break for lunch, if you allow, because I really think uh, we should really uh, thoroughly discuss um, if there is not urgent questions right now, I would maybe ask you to, could you go a little bit more into Chris Marker, so that maybe those who are not familiar with Chris Marker could understand what you pointed out as a joke in the context of language and film. I think everybody understood it, that it was, why it was a joke. I mean, so it's a joke on film. It's a joke about, I mean, the films the others are doing. Um, and then so far one can say um, it's a joke that uh, 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 Marker is doing in the on the background of film history. And uh, not only on film history, but also on, uh, um, and this comes then comes to this, the first part of the joke, um, to the sentence, a pigeon, transforms into a man, um, what is already a kind of a short story about Christian um, transformation uh, uh, ideas, transformational ideas. And you have in many film shots, you have again, I mean, the white uh, uh, pigeon uh, uh, flying out of the image uh, in a, a, a matrix, matrix, you have it. And so, um, so it's a famous shot in film also because film can, I mean, do this kind of uh, miracle shots. And uh, so he can do this kind of enchanting wonder things. And uh, uh, I think he just uh, um, does it as a kind of a, a minimalist artist um, with a kind of art de povera uh, 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 props, so to yeah. say. So he takes a real pigeon um, and he is doing the transformation in the other way around. So it's also a comment, and it's a, a s uh, this leads me to the full frame of the film that is a political film uh, called Chat Perché. Uh, uh, so it, uh, it Perché is you know a, a term you use 
for this kind of uh, um, very, I mean, uh, uh, idyllic villages that are, I mean, you know, nestled on a hill. So it's nestled cats. And uh, 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 it goes back to um, um, uh, an amateur artist who was a sprayer and who sprayed all over France um, this grinning cat. Uh, I can show you if you want. If you have time for yeah. this. Yeah, of course. So this would be the uh, Une armée de Chajon uh, envahit les murs, uh, uh, an army of uh, yellow uh, cats uh, 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 invaded uh, the walls. Yeah? And uh, it becomes a, a symbol of, uh, um, uh, uh, of hope and political representation in a very, I mean, complex way, again, where this whole issue of representation is at stake. And uh, uh, Mark here brings this film um, to manifestations at the time. I don't go now for the content of these manifestations where the sh cats were already, I mean, being political symbols. So tr they transform themselves from images, you know, um, into kind of living symbols. From the representation of the symbol, they become, you know. Um, and this is uh, one of the, uh, uh, the other jokes uh, 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 Marquea is doing. So he's uh, uh, doing his own alphabet. Uh, uh, confederation, uh, humanists, and anarchists, and uh, 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 workers. So sha means, you know, so it's this kind of playing with uh, this old techniques of taking the, uh, the letters um, for, I mean, a kind of a pictorial representation um, of, of, of a, a proper name or word. And you can see he plays with this. It's all about um, taking uh, language as graphemes, as uh, 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 modes of pictorialization, and so. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the orange cat, that's Marquea's cat. So he has also kind of a, 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 a Marquea uh, typical uh, a cat symbol in his work. And so he brings together his cat supports the cat of the other. Um, and he has already a kind of a, 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 a transformation um, where he um, shows that cats were always a kind of, I mean, symbol or companion um, of humans, human beings, and he shows it uh, through a short history of art. And uh, here he integrated the cat into a kind of uh, a cave painting. Um, so it's, you see, it's all very ironical. It's all about, and here is a kind of cubist cat. Um, and you have the <laughs> revolutionary Soviet cat. <laughs> so it goes through this whole history of uh, So finally, the film ends with the disappearance of the cats at this unpleasant historical moment um, when, uh, uh, you know, in the French election um, uh, 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 cycle, um, there was a kind of a problem where um, the French left had to vote for the French conservatives um, to avoid uh, uh, the right winger Le Pen coming into power. So and it was all about, the, let's say, the tragedy of French politics, um, I mean, manifested itself in this paradoxical voting process. And this is a moment where the cats are disappearing. And then at the end of the film, they are reappearing, and they are kind of uh, what Kant had called Geschichtszeichen. So they became a sign of hope that history my in the change in the future. So it's a very complicated film on some level, 
um, even if he's very light in this uh, ironical way, um, dealing with future memories. And uh, um, so it might be interesting for a discourse on synesthesia, um, how this kind of uh, synesthetic um, montage of images and words are used here indeed uh, to, on some level, to create a memory that will be the memory of our future. So it ends with the reappearance of the cats um, as symbols of the future. So, I mean, Mark Hare is maybe you know, uh, maybe his most famous film was the one he has done with Alain René, um, uh, uh, Night and Fog, Nuit Brouillard, and uh, so he's known as a documentarist, but basically he's what one calls an essay filmmaker. So it's a kind of political discourse he's uh, uh, following in um, uh, uh, this montage of images, uh, uh, language, um, and sound. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that he's uh, uh, also um, doing this with uh, digital uh, post-production. Um, so you have also kind of, a, um, let's say, new aesthetic of images where you no longer have this kind of one um, perspectival focus in each shot. So he can have multiple focuses in one shot through his digital post-production. What is also interesting in, a in what uh, is there a synesthetic moment between images? I mean, in images it's, uh, themselves. And uh, um, so he has... Something in the middle of the image uh, comes like an explosion, or you know, you can say it's a kind of anamorphic montage. And uh, this, I think, is very interesting that uh, this gives this kind of internal. But basically, it, uh, uh, the, I mean, let's say, in when we speak about what will be, I mean, let's say, the future of synesthesia um, by mixing um, analog and digital imagery, um, then you can study Mark Hare as one example where he's indeed doing this interplay with the registration function of an analog camera and the uh, uh, anamorphotic um, aspects of the digital. And uh, it's very rare that you have it in filmmaking uh, that someone mixes these two um, ways. 
Okay. Um, are there questions and comments right now, finally? Yeah, James, and then Paulina, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I especially appreciated this. And um, your the, the second synesthetic model that you're that you're proposing for cinema, I have to say that the first thing that came to mind was Godard's Histoire du Cinema, because of the the text, image, voice, his voice, like the way he describes cinema seems to be exactly this model that you're establishing, which made me think about both Marker and Godard being directors who very much play with um, duration and film length and really pushing the boundaries of how long you can make somebody sit in the dark and watch something. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that actually is part of this model that you're presenting in terms of a extended experience, the, the fact that their films are do tend to be on the longer side if this is something that you read in your work on Marker. I mean, Mark Hare would not fall on this uh, long durée uh, 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 track. Um, Chaperche, it's uh, under an hour. Yeah, but but he has also very long films. But uh, I would say um, when we just discuss it in uh, 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 terms of synesthesia, I would say more that as it uh, uh, based on a model um, that is meaning a specific in the Heideggerian sense, even a being in the world. So like uh, when you read Merleau-Ponty on synesthesia, he would claim the same. I mean that synesthesia just means that we are as bodily beings um, in the world communicating, so to say, with the world through all our, I mean, being our existence, so to say. And on some level you can say um, taking this notion of synesthesia as this kind of general description of a specific way of human beings being involved. Animals may be the same. I, I'm, I'm not a specialist in this, but I guess um, they live in, in a world also. Um, then you can say, yes, it's in so far it's endless what is also the problem, because it's on some level, it's this kind of idea also um, that there are no borders. It's a borderless world. And uh, so what I like in this idea that it's go against this identity claims. So it's not this, you know, you just catch one identity and that's it. Um, but it has this kind of a, a, a enormous, I mean, open horizon. Um, what film, in many ways, um, simulates um, with this mobility and dynamism of uh, a moving camera that leaves, I mean, on some level, um, the world of framed images, um, as it has always this potential or the virtuality, um, to put in, in, in the Deleuzean terms, um, to, I mean, move a bit and then you would have another horizon, another world. So on some level, yes, I would say this has to do with this uh, second model um, and what you can see, I think, even in this Freud model that is basically already like a, a rhizome arctic. So, you know, it's uh, um, it includes um, nearby, or, le or let's say it entails the possibility to include uh, 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 whole varieties of objects. And this one can say maybe uh, um, the synesthetic pleasure in film as also already Rancière uh, 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 describes it, I mean in this possibility um, to show infinite objects. So it's on some level a medium of inclusion even if it goes always for shots and extracts and so, but from its aesthetic 
and poetic uh, um, program, so to say. Um, it has this kind of uh, dynamizing effect of uh, uh, opening horizons instead of closing them. Okay, I would say maybe Paulina and the last um, question from Katarina, and then we will close the conversation. Well, thank you, this was very interesting. Uh, I have a number of questions here. Um, just a brief one at first, which is about the music. I think music is really important, but I didn't hear you talk about it, so I'll be curious to hear both about the pigeon and then about the cat. Um, then uh, I have a question uh, about the integration uh, or the synthesis, as you sort of seem to uh, suggest in terms of uh, Marquer's uh, work. Uh, on some level, it seems that the pigeon uh, little clip, uh, it's a one-liner joke, that's for sure there, but it reminds me more not of this integration, which will be more of the illusionistic type of uh, film, but more uh, in terms of, let's say, Foucault's um, essay on uh, um, on Magritte, Cecina Pime and Pip. It seems to be like this heterotopia there that they're not really intimately uh, connected, and maybe in a way montage and collage do this anyway, but it seems that they exist in these different spaces, and you see one and you see the other, and somehow you connect them, and that's sort of how the joke works, because otherwise, if they're synesthetically, synthetically connected, it's gonna be like way too utopian for it to be, uh, to be funny. Uh, and uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. I had a question about Merleau-Ponty, but I think that you answered it, so mm -hmm. I'll just stop here. I mean, let's say, if one really goes in a close reading <laughs> of the one-liner, mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing is that it's not done with a cut. Mm -hmm. oh it's yeah. one movement of the camera yeah. uh, that just, I mean, on some level uh, moves around the axis, so it goes a little bit higher so that the pigeon uh, 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 doesn't go around the curve, so to mm -hmm. say. And so how about the title itself? Is the title integrated in the shot? I mean, I just don't remember at this point. It's no, it's very classical. It's you have yeah. this, uh, a, a card uh, with the title, mm -hmm. and then you have the the camera movement. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's two different uh, uh, things. But it's one sentence, so to say. If you would look for, excuse me. <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's thirty seconds. It's the Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's always the death of a joke if you analyze it. It's, uh, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it really lifts from this shortness. Uh, that you see this pompous title card, and then comes this very short uh, uh, sequence, where the music is basically um, making allusions to uh, suspense thrillers or mm -hmm. something, you know. And uh, so this would be also, let's say, if you go really in a, in a, 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 a deeper analysis, you could say that uh, um, the, the words that he's using um, transforms so transforms is indeed where you can say 
the Sachvorstellung, you know, the op when you, I mean, try to, I mean, have a kind of uh, 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 imaginative uh, 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 presentation, a presentation of it, kind of mental image, so it would be a kind of time image. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a process, it's not something you would have in one image, so it's a, 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 it's a flow already. Yeah. And uh, so, and so far it's interesting that, and this what I say is this kind of synesthetic thing, um, that you know, the transformation goes through a very slow movement. Even it's so quick, the movement is very slow. The camera is very slow. It's uh, it's a man, f I mean, tracking the cam to the tracking shot with a camera. Mm -hmm. So it's a handheld cam hand camera. Mm -hmm. Okay, final. Thanks.